So, uh, I don't remember, you told me, but uh, just a moment. I don't remember, did you uh, did you grow up in this area? or uh? In the Virgin Islands. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, born in New York, but raised in the Virgin Islands. Born in yeah. New York. And so, uh, you told me, but I, yeah, you, s you have memories from there, yeah? From the island? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, well, you came here when you were 10 or something like 10 that? 10 or 11. 10, 10 yeah. 11, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, give us some glimpses okay. into life in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> <laughs> island or islands? Uh, there are several? Or, uh, yeah, so there, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John uh -huh. is the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh -huh. And of course, my dad's from St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. But we grew up like four years there, about four years on St. Croix, which is the other island, mm -hmm. the bigger island. Oh, sorry. St. Thomas is the bigger, St. Croix is the smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we spent four on each island and um, then we wound up in Back the to States. New York? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said uh, Brooklyn? Brooklyn, Brooklyn yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember a little bit. I don't know how you remember all this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrice, we are ready to start. Good. Okay. Welcome to this program. Thank you for uh, res responding to my invitation. You bring something new to, to this program. Uh, as far as I am aware of, you are the first one who was raised in a, I think, absolutely beautiful place. <laughs> Virgin Islands. Tell us a little bit about that. Why were you born there and raised, I mean, raised there? Tell us a little bit about your family of origin. Sure. Also, thank you for having me. My really pleasure. appreciate the invitation. Yeah, so my early life was, was interesting. I was born in New York, mm -hmm. maybe spent about a year there, I think a little less than a year. But um, my, par my parents met up in the States and I think they were trying to have us raised away from the big city. Oh. So they decided to move down to St. Thomas. Interesting. Uh, that's where my dad's from. I see. So he grew up there and in the British Virgin Islands to a little small volcanic island called Nevis. Mm -hmm. But we were in that area for the first part of my life. So St. Thomas was, of course, like you said, beautiful. Um, spent a lot of time with family, really tight with the family. Mm -hmm. There's four kids in our family. Four so, kids? Yeah. When I went down there, it was just me and my sister. Uh -huh. You two more have been born there. Yeah, and then my mm -hmm. brother and sister, they were born on the island. I see. So, you know, growing up there was really tight-knit family. Um, we went from that island, then we moved over to St. Croix. And, of course, our church family was really tight there, too. Really um, organic, you know. So what family. kind of life uh, did you have with the... You, uh, did you live uh, uh, like a city life or on a farm or how, how was or a combination? Oh, yeah. I guess you could call it like the suburbs. Suburbs. Um, mm -hmm. There's not really a downtown. There is, there's two parts of the island, especially the one that I remember the most is St. Croix. Mm -hmm. There's a place called Frederickstead and a place called Christianstead. Um, Fre Christianstead, I believe, is the bigger part of the island, but that's where we grew up. And it was off into the hills, a little area called Scion Farm. Um, Goats, cows, <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was really quiet. But of course, you know, we had little neighborhoods and that's where we grew up. Um, really quiet, you mm -hmm. know, beautiful. chill, beautiful area. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd yeah. roam on the, on the hills up and down and... Uh, Say one more time. You would roam on the hills and... Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we'd walk to school and our, I mean, it was really safe. You know, it's a small community. So mm -hmm. we'd walk, me and my sister remember walking from my house all the way down to the bus stop and you pass mm -hmm. through pastures and uh -huh. you know goats and all kinds of <laughs> cool stuff <laughs> yeah so a really cool area to grow up in and any explore. unusual events uh, uh, like uh, tornadoes or oh, other yeah. things oh yeah yeah er early on uh, one of the biggest things we went through was a hurricane hurricane Hur hugo oh, yeah. i think it was 1992 91 uh -huh. or 92 i'm not sure i don't remember but, or yeah, something like that. Either yeah. way, that was the biggest um, storm I've ever been in. I see. And we didn't get off the island. We actually stayed on St. Croix for that island. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I remember the whole night, my dad and my mom, as a family, we piled into one room on the master bed and we sat there and prayed. And, you know, they have these shutters in the island where you can you know, batten down the hatches, I guess you could call it. And um, we heard the winds outside, the rain, and there was leaks, and there was a little bit of flooding and things, but... But mm, you were protected in general. All in all, protected. And mm. the aftermath was the scary part, you know. There wasn't very many resources, so to we'd have to... see the destruction and the, exactly. uh, the lack of these basic, uh, basic foods and water. And exactly, everything. yeah. So that was interesting. I mean, even as a kid, I remember powdered milk. <laughs> <laughs> we had some government uh, supplies mm -hmm. come in, so mm -hmm. we'd have to. We were exposed to like government milk, cheese, and mm -hmm. all kinds of resources that they brought in for the island, because some of the water was dank. It sure. was not worth drinking, you know. Sure. Um, they have cisterns, mm -hmm. and you know the rainwater comes in, it fills it up. But sometimes mm -hmm. if it sits for too long, it can get um, yeah, yeah. rancid. Spoiled, yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was just once, or you had storms fairly. Remember thunderstorms, remember? Uh, yeah. But as far as that the islands are interesting, you can be on one side and you can see a storm passing by, or like a rain shower passing on one side uh -huh. of the street, the other is completely sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in my, my young years too, but that was the only storm I went through in that part of my childhood. Were you far from the, from the ocean? Um, well, being that it's an island, I think it's, you, you couldn't see it you from your house. You couldn't see it. But it was a little drive away. I and see. we spent a lot of time at the beach. You time. did? Oh yeah. 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 Um, my dad, he, of course, grew up on the island, so he took every chance he got to take us ah. down to the beach. And, you know, we played as in the waves and everything. My little brother, being born on the island, we have photos of him, like, you know, in his element, <laughs> <laughs> getting knocked over by waves, crying, <laughs> and then running back in. Mm. And so, yeah, really well, attached happy to child. the island. Happy childhood, happy in, childhood. In, the, in the nature. Oh, yeah. What about school? Did you like school? School is interesting. Went to a private event to school, private really? elementary school, kindergarten, first grade, I believe. Um, at some point, we went into homeschooling, though. My mm -hmm. mom taught us. Oh. So, um, she, yeah, the first part, we, you know, we wore the uniforms, my, my sister and I, and it was very strict and regimented, you know, yeah. some orderly mm -hmm. uh, upbringing there, but it was still good. It was good for you? It was good for me. It was good. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anything else, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember when my mom started teaching us, it was a little bit more relaxed, but yes. she focused more on the relationship of learning versus, you know, the, the mm -hmm. curriculum. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. you know, you had to be at this class at this time. Mm -hmm. Or she made it more, more personable to us. And because she was teaching, she told it in a way of storytelling. I so I think that's where I get it from, to be honest. Ah. Yeah. And uh, so your mother, uh, was she trained as a teacher? She wasn't. She wasn't, no, but no. She, she developed this gift and uh, she, did. she was self-educated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she is a high school, she graduated high school, oh, she, but she, never she, went she. into college. Uh -huh. And so she did develop this talent to work with people, mm -hmm. with children. Mm -hmm. um, she worked in church a lot too, so her one-on-one -on -one relationship with people is, is it's a gift from God. There's very few people that I can see. Um, that the way she works with people and mm. reach them and yeah, you're right. She's self-developed, but also it, she I think God told her earlier on This is what her Wonderful. gift was. Wonderful. She's never departed from it uh, In in the state of New, in New York mm -hmm. was she raised in the city or uh, Upstate New York in the oh city yeah. how it was for her <laughs> to come from such a huge city yeah. in the middle of the nowhere <laughs> <laughs> to the islands in the yeah. yeah all i know is now she says she's not interested in going back you know now in her in this state of her life but in the when she met my dad and they decided to go down it was a you know of course they keep she at the center it was a joint um, decision mm -hmm. but uh it she was a city girl she grew up in brooklyn new york yeah. <laughs> and you know knew nothing but the city it was a <laughs> hard knocks kind of person. Met my dad who was more of a laid back, easy going uh -huh. guy. So that they complimented each other very well. I see. And in some way along the way, he convinced her, I have this beautiful island. Do you want to <laughs> leave the big city and, you know, raise our kids down there? And she, she adapted very well. She adapted. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, but at one point uh, they decided to return uh, to the States. I mean, uh, Virgin Islands mm -hmm. is also uh, an American territory. It is, yeah. It is yeah. a U.S. territory, so mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't need passports or anything to move yes, back and forth. Yes. But, but um, uh, they decided to return to New York again? Yes. Yeah. So because they had um, found Jesus 
separately, but then met and they started going to church together in New York. Uh, when they moved from the Virgin Islands back up to the States, of course, they went back to the church that they remember. Yeah. And that's where we, I remember like, ah. the, the memories from the islands are more clear than the islands from in New York when we moved back. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a culture shock, yeah, you know, because yeah. all we knew was the islands. Mm -hmm. All we knew was island culture. And moving from culture to culture is always, you know, kind of jarring for a kid. Yeah. But, you know, we, we just kind of went along with it. And, you know, really warm families. Everybody that they knew, we got reintroduced to. So they had already <laughs> established relationships and those people had kids. Yes, yes. So we made their kids and we'd be mm -hmm. like, you know, I guess, I guess this is our church family now. Oh, it was to adjust to the American schools now. It was rough. It was rough. <laughs> it was rough. Mm -hmm. It was, um, well, we were homeschooled in uh, yeah. New York. Yeah. Ah, in New York as well. Yeah, we were homeschooled oh. up there. And then only when we went um, to Athens, Georgia, uh -huh. when we moved back to, or down south and my dad found a job. Yes. Um, moving so us up here was to find work for my dad. He's a, he worked in the hospital, lab technologist, a hematologist. I see. I see. So he came up to the States to find better work. Mm -hmm. And of course our family was expanding. So find a home and work and uh, move to Athens. We settled in Athens, Georgia. We could have been in Pennsylvania, Maryland, or New York, but mm. we settled in North Florida. So for how long have you been uh, uh, in New York before moving to Athens, Georgia? Um, I would say six months to a year. Oh, so quite yeah. short. It's quite, quite short. short. It I wasn't see. enough to grow roots. I see, I see. But um, as we stayed with my grandma at the time up there, that's when he was going all up and down the East Coast, like mm -hmm. searching for work searching. and getting accredited. Yes. Yeah. I see. And uh, did you enjoy uh, this uh, move, this transition to Georgia? <laughs> <laughs> I remember strapping up this um, Pontiac 6000 green station wagon <laughs> with everything we owned, Ooh. like the Beverly Hillbillies, strapped everything onto the <laughs> roof with the tarp, <laughs> and all six of us carpooling down or road tripping down to Athens, Georgia. <laughs> it was, I'll never forget it. It, it was yeah. one of the most. Um, it, it's still deep in me. I do really? road trip now because of that trip. And ever since, every year we do this trip back and forth really? to New York or at the, the time. With the same car? <laughs> at, the, mm -hmm. at that point we did. And then we had to change cars because we got bigger and <laughs> there was no space. We outgrew the station wagon. <laughs> so we got a minivan and then we take the trip to New York to visit my grandma every year. Yeah, for Thanksgiving. Mm. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking at the time you were going to do in life? Ah, at that time of life? What was I thinking? I, I think because our family was so, we had four kids um, and we're two years apart each. Mm. And because of that, I think we just knew that if we had each other, we'd be fine no matter where we went mm -hmm. because we've been so many different places. So I guess we wondered what Athens was like. We had no mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. We knew what New York was like because, you know, of our parents' filter. Sure. But they hadn't even been to the South or Athens before. Mm -hmm. So we really just picked everything up, landed in Athens, Georgia, and kind of began this life in a little, the first place we ever stayed was this little motel. Oh. Um, for about, I think it was four, maybe not that long, four or five days, I'm not sure. Uh. Until we got the house, the rental house mm -hmm. ready. And then we had our own space. We kind of... Um, it was out in the country next to fields and cows. Really? <laughs> so again, back to the uh, rural mm -hmm. area. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, then we, we were homeschooled there too in mm -hmm. Athens for a little bit. Then my mom said, the church that we're going to, that we found here, they have a small church school. Uh -huh. So we, it was an Adventist school and we went yeah. there too. Yeah, yeah. So that was our, we crept into the culture there with um, that Adventist school. So that was tough when you said it was tough to, to go to, to school? It wasn't as bad. Not, not, not as bad. It didn't get tough until high school. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> but uh, in the early days, that was, it was a one-room school. Mm -hmm. So we had lower graders all the way up to upper graders, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was like maybe 24 kids or so. Not even that much. Actually, actually that's too much. It's probably around 12 to... Really? Yeah, it, it was a really small school. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we got along well with everybody and we took up the majority of the school <laughs> since it was all four of us. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we, in, we introduced them to our way of life. And, then we <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, we had a lot of inside jokes and everything, so we'd share that way. But yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> we were always the most in every scenario because it's four kids. <laughs> <clears throat> So what we're thinking about 
doing later in life? Oh, so I remember um, we used to have, in this one-room school, we used to have these buckets. And in these folders, mm -hmm. there were these subcategories or categories of work you could do. And we were mm -hmm. supposed to do book reports every Friday on these, mm -hmm. you know, these career paths. So I remember searching through it and seeing all the options. And it was very generic, you know, like air, air, um, uh, air what do you call it, a pilot or mm -hmm. doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer. And I remember coming, one, uh, coming across one that said, a meteorologist and I was like you know I, I'm not good at math I'm not good at English you know <laughs> but I do love science so mm -hmm. I really thought that one day I would be a meteorologist mm -hmm. like study the weather which yes. was a really cool career so I wrote reports on that one pretty frequently mm -hmm. yeah that's when I understood the most of and did you follow that I followed the science, but didn't follow the meteorologist path. I, I went through a bunch of different iterations of what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, especially when I was younger. I wanted to be a computer graphics mm. um, developer. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing um, all those early on movies of computer generated images, and I thought that was the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. But later on, I would become that guy. I actually went into that one. But before that, I saw the meteorology versus, so it was the art versus the practical science mm -hmm. side of things. and. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an optometrist, an mm -hmm. eye doctor, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a meteorologist, but then I went towards the creative side. Uh -huh. Yeah, that just spoke to me a little bit more. So you, you went to, to study or you, you tried to have some hands-on uh, uh, training? Or um, both? Both. both. And when I was in the early years, I, my dad and me and my brother were, my dad used to bring home old computers. Like really old computers that you know people didn't want anymore. So what we do is we'd actually build them up to oh. working condition. Mm. I remember reading through manuals of DOS really? and Microsoft, yeah, yeah. old, old, old that manuals, and learning how to build a computer. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. So that's how I got started with the technical stuff, mm -hmm. and then actually that lent into me building my own computer mm. to make my first movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any kind of experience on either the software or the hardware side. So I built my own computer from scratch, used the hardware to edit the software to edit my film. It was, yeah, I always just had this, you know, desire inside me to create. So yeah, it yeah. all built in together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you produced a movie? Um, I did produce a movie. I did a lot of little small ones. And I remember, um, in, you remember those Hi8 video cameras that yeah, came with yeah, the cassette? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the way we used to make movies back then as kids was we used to shoot um, and then stop, then plan the scene, then shoot the scene, then plan the scene. No editing required. We just kind of shot the scene, scene by scene. Mm -hmm. If we missed a scene, you know, it would just be lost forever. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, we just, we didn't show anybody. We just, as kids, we were, thought it was funny. We rewound them and then watched it again. And who knows where those tapes are now? <laughs> but... Um, that's what, was, that's what got me started. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I started to learn about editing and what that was like, you know, I thought only people in Hollywood could do it, but mm -hmm. I didn't realize anybody could do it if you had the right kind of software. I didn't learn that until um, after high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that so answered your question. Yeah, so you were thinking on doing uh, that now uh, as a career for your living? No. No, it was just a hobby. Still just a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, I remember thinking in high school, what can I do with film? Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, Ro Roger and Ebert back in the day, they were the film critics. Mm -hmm. They, um, if you, I was, we weren't allowed to watch movies as kids. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't watch movies at all as kids, but I don't know why I was drawn to movies so mm -hmm. much. Um, but I remember there were these critics that used to watch the movies and talk about the movies mm -hmm. and kind of give their opinion on them. I thought maybe that's what I was meant to do. Since I love movies, but I don't know how to make them, yes. maybe I'm meant to write about movies or, yes. or you know, be a critic of yeah, a movie. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just, I never really struck me until college that I could actually make it a career if I was serious about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you develop a little bit of your critical skills? Commenting uh, movies? I watched a lot of movies. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good pretext. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I know, I think I know movies now because I watched, I watched, after a certain point, my dad was like, you know, you're an adult, you can choose what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think it was after 17, 18. 
you know, he's, he just said, you know, just be smart about it. You know, you're not allowed to watch you know, hard R movies and all that stuff. But we, I had a refined taste, I guess, younger. I liked storytelling more than I liked, you know, blood and guts and violence and yeah, all that. Yeah. But the storytelling was what it was about. I see. And I remember venturing into foreign films and independent films. Mm -hmm. And that's what spoke to me. There were stories that I had never heard before. Old, old classics and old producers and directors. I was into those. Mm -hmm. And I still am to this day. The 1940s, 1930s style of directing. Still storytelling. The best storytelling that can ever be done is those kinds of movies. Mm. Um, outside of, you know, literature. Um, but <laughs> I understand that because I think in pictures. And that's the way my mind works. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, as I watched a lot of movies, I started getting a taste for them. And as I studied the masters of the old art of filmmaking, I started criticizing the new art of filmmaking. And um, it just didn't hold up. And you're just like, they're, they're cutting corners and <laughs> they're not really telling the stories. They're being lazy. And I knew what that looked like. Oh, so I, had, I developed that eye and I was like, I can do something with this. But instead, I decided to instead criticize, maybe make my own. And tell my own story. So you didn't begin uh, writing for publication or for mm, no, it was just yeah your own yeah, just thinking uh, about thinking it. and evaluating exactly and to un trying to understand mm -hmm. to go I beyond the beyond the surface. Yes, the subtext of movies mm. is what I was interested mm. in. What was the artist trying to say? Mm. And you know the flashiness of movies these days is a lot of flashiness, but. Yeah. Back then, there was very little of that flashiness. It was about all the subtext of mm -hmm. who the characters were, um, what the director want, meant to say, or you know, what what are they trying you t to get you to believe, or what's the um, yeah, that's what's quite, the direction? Quite interesting, and unfortunately, <coughs> you it's interesting that you 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 realized uh, your need to uh, to understand to to read the subtext and. Uh, mm -hmm the meanings and everything by yourself, apparently without no input yeah. from outside. But it's unfortunately that uh, probably most of the most of, most of the people, you know, they watch lots of movies, but they they have no mm. interest and no training. Uh, they have no s discerning skills. That's right. Yeah. And uh, they just absorb That's everything right. mm -hmm. un at an unconscious. Yeah, it just washes level. over them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're right, it does unconsciously something stick in their minds and they don't even understand that it's a programming. With movies, it's mm -hmm. there is someone else has created um reality that they're, they're programming you to view. Yeah. Um what do you call it? Uh I forget the name of it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It is unfortunate that most people don't choose to understand deeper than they don't they reflect mm -hmm. uh, in a deliberate way, right. trying to understand and uh, to to be aware of the way they are also influenced. Exactly. By that. Discerning, you said it earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at one point you decided you can be on the other side of the, yeah. the line, doing your own uh, production. What yeah. kind of production did you start with and what were the means? We speak now about uh, maybe early 2000? Yeah, let's say, uh, well, right around after high school, after I graduated high school, um, I became kind of, you know, listless, kind of aimless. Mm -hmm. um, right around that time, excuse me, that was when I graduated in May 2001. I see. Um, uh, from high school. Mm -hmm. And then I started school in August. Or September, mm -hmm. but either way, September 2001 was September 11th, mm -hmm. and that's when you know we were told that you know we were going to war by this woman passing by in the lobby of that of the school that we were at, the mm -hmm. community college. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you what do you mean we're going to war? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just started college. You know, I have all these ideas in mm -hmm. my head, all these accomplishments that I like to do for mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And so I started wondering what was the point. You know, what was the point of you know if the world's coming to an end. I started getting really um, discouraged mm -hmm. with my career path, first of all, and kind of confused on the direction of my life. It didn't really, I didn't really have a direction. Even though I, I was raised in church and, you know, we knew that, you know, the end of the soon, you know, soon coming. But 
that's all we really had to look forward to. So it, it felt like it was the end, but it didn't feel like the end. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen next? We, we weren't, I wasn't sure what to do. And you know, no one really knew what to do next um, after those last few days. So what I wound up doing was um, doing what I was good at. I became very melancholy after that. Mm -hmm. So I just started to write my own movies um, and produce them and shoot them. And that's when I created the computer to oh, make my own movie. Mm -hmm. And then after I had developed kind of a library of films I had made, I decided to do a mini film festival with my friends and I invited them over to this little theater um, and I showed off my films and, you know. So who was doing the acting? Um, friends. Friends. Just friends. <laughs> Whoever was available um, to do. So you developed a, a storyline and you... Yeah. Yeah, I developed storylines, like characters. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were very pensive films. There weren't a lot of, it wasn't about dialogue. Again, studying the old um, filmmaking mm -hmm. and foreign films, I noticed that a lot of dialogue isn't necessary. It's mm -hmm. more about the action, the emotion, mm -hmm. the raw mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, well, some of the old films are dialogue driven, but my personal style was just telling a story with the character, you know, of course the hero's journey of wanting something, achieving something, going through tribulation or trial, then overcoming at the mm -hmm. end. And my big thing was, you know, sometimes it's an unresolved, I think that was my thing because of what I was going through at the time, it was always an unresolved ending. Mm -hmm. Let the audience choose their own, mm -hmm. <laughs> decide their own ending, I guess. So both of they were short, short, they were short films. films. Like? Mm -hmm. Maybe like 30 minutes. Oh, not, minutes not that short. <laughs> 30 minutes, it's a lot. <laughs> it's true. The first movie I ever made was about 45 minutes. Oh, my. That was a long one. And, uh, you know, that whole style of filmmaking, it, it, it was like a narrative, but it was hard for my friends to watch it because they were, you know, they were young and they were into the same film I was. They were just mm -hmm. watching it because I had made it, but not so much um, into the film. I was like, no, you guys have to watch it. There's so Ooh. much more meaning. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I felt I felt myself like the filmmakers, the real filmmakers. Out there. I was like, they don't really get it. You know? <laughs> There's so much in this movie, but they, I just appreciated them showing up and you know showing support. That was what huge. was next? Next was um, there was still nothing. So actually. apparently, you were not very concerned of doing something for a living for you, <laughs> yeah? All right. well, you, you did something in the meantime. Well, in the meantime, I was doing, uh, I worked as a bellman at a hotel. Oh. So I was, I was working menial jobs. Like, mm. you know, it was, it was a pretty good job. Mm. I worked at a hotel um, for three years. And I also worked at um, a telemarketing place. Mm -hmm. So um, that was th my means of having an income. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I was going to school and I had some student loans that I'd taken out to go mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I remember... What really set me back, there was a lot of setbacks. There was this, of course, 2011, the, um, the tax happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then two years later, in 2003, I was supposed to take all those credits and transfer to a different school. Yeah. But the school I was with, which is a small Christian college, they closed down. And all of my credits went with it. <laughs> so oh. I was stuck with having to repeat everything that I just mm. did. A few, very few of those um, classes were credited. So I, they took them with me to the next school. Mm. But... I was just, I cannot get any traction here. You know, it was very discouraging. And I just remember being like, you know what? I'll just, I'll just go with the flow. I'll just follow what I'm, the prescribed path. My dad wants me to go to college. I'll just do college and work. How was your relation with God at that time? My relationship with God was, God, with God was um, it was weakening. And I can say that because now I, I look back and I remember, um, of course, the influence of my college years and everything, and then losing a little bit of hope. And, you know, on a real, like, spiritual level, I was searching for more. Mm -hmm. As I was becoming uh, an adult, moving from teenage years into adulthood and seeing my friends kind of not know what they want to do either. Mm -hmm. Some of them went on to be, actually I have a good friend, he went on to be a tank commander when the war happened, when, the, um, when he, went, he got sent over to Afghanistan and he did I think three or four years over there, I'm not sure, but um, he, was, he's, he went with purpose. I remember that and I haven't talked to him in a while, but my other friends, they were kind of like, you know, we don't know what to do either. So mm -hmm. 
um, that kind of weighed on me as far as my career. As far as spiritually, I remember looking for more, asking for more, searching in church, but not really getting a grasp of the things. Mm -hmm. So I remember in college, we had philosophy class. I remember philosophy doing a lot of questioning, not so much of what I believe, but questioning of what everyone else believes. Sure. You know, that's when I think my mind got exposed to more of the grand scope of you know, worldview, mm -hmm. what that means exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, I started meeting other people in other religions, and I was questioning what they believed, and I'd never done that before. Up until this point, I, you know, just believed as I was told, or I didn't really ask too many questions about, you know, what I believed. I just kind of believed it, I was baptized into it, and that was that. But as I became older, I wanted to know more. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it became a, a more of a journey. I was always looking for more. I became very introspective. I guess I've always kind of been introspective, but more introspective mm -hmm. as an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the time when you became you you came to 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 own your faith, to feel a responsibility, to to find your own answers, to make your own decisions, Absolutely. to 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 map the territory for you and to to know what are you going to stand for. Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember, yeah, I remember the, the, that, that moment when I was, I did exactly what you just said, actually, mm -hmm. that's funny you said that, that way, but um, I remember questioning everything, and then I remember uh, when I was in, I think I started the new school, and I was, I had this overwhelming feeling this one day that I was loved by God. Hmm. The God that I know from childhood, the God that my parents believed in, the God of the Bible. I remember that feeling and it was overwhelming and I couldn't stop this beaming, this pride and you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to share it with everybody mm. else. And it seemed like the more I wanted to share in college, it's not easy to share oh, because yeah. everybody believes the same thing. They believe, you know, for the most part, there is no God or if there is a God, there's this like everybody's version of a God. Yeah. So that really, I mean, when you hear it in theory as a child or when you hear it in theory in church, it's like, you know, go tell the world, you know, about the God you believe in. And then as you go into secular college, you realize the world really doesn't care. It really, the world's just trying to get by. <laughs> and whatever God works for them is the God they believe in. Or no God, that works for them too. Yeah. So that became very real to me too. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, I think I started losing the grasp on that faith. Even when that point when I had that realization, is, I remember that's when it started getting a little bit weaker. Because I think that's when I started getting more of a, attacked by the enemy. Mm -hmm. And I can look back now and see that, but at the time, You're not totally oblivious. <laughs> oblivious. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I went to a Christian school too. So my high school years were in Christian school. My, the beginning of my college was in a Christian private school. Then it went to like a public college, or I'm sorry, it was UGA, or Satellite College of UGA. Mm -hmm. So um, the belief system there was a little bit different. Sure. <coughs> so you were studying and uh, uh, working uh, to further your uh, uh, filmmaking uh, skills. Well, um, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so to fast forward to that part, it's mm -hmm. after I had lost a little bit of that relationship with God, I went to this phase where I was very social. Mm -hmm. So my biggest thing was just throwing parties for my friends. I became very social. I knew a lot of people. I like to be around people. They like to be around me. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing that I did was I threw a lot of parties. Me and my mm -hmm. friends would throw parties and have people over and they became so big and we became so popular mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, it became more meaningful than anything. Mm -hmm. That's when I remember, you know, not going to church anymore, not reaching out to church friends and, um, like living more like the world and a lot of the time and this is the hard part to remember is a lot of my friends were actually christians they weren't adventists but they were christians because mm -hmm. i went to was to school with some of them mm -hmm. in my high school mm -hmm. so the way that they live was you know they drink beer on the weekends or they'd have a beer or so you know on a, whenever they were got off work or something mm -hmm. and so i started picking up their bad habits mm -hmm. and it was just became a lifestyle, you know, oh, I'm stressed out, have a beer. Or, mm -hmm. oh man, this has been a hard week, we don't have the money, 
let's let's throw a party. You know, we we throw parties when we didn't have money. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. Instead of fundraising, which I was good at, I should have just done that. <laughs> we threw parties. People would come, and you know, it make you feel more, um, give you more of a status. So it make your feelings uh, go up. You know, and I didn't. Um, I can look back now and see all sure. this as a mature person. But before, I was like, oh, I don't feel good about where I am in life. I'm gonna throw a party. <laughs> Instantly felt better. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, um, you know, people would call you up and say, hey, are we going out? Are we having a party this weekend? And you'd be like, I don't feel like it, but, you know, they must be my friends. They're calling me. You know, I have more people calling me and everything. So, yeah. And uh, at this point is when I started really considering uh, what I was going to do in life. I met a woman that she saw more in me. And she's like, so is this all we're going to do in life? Or are you you're just going to party your whole rest of your life. And I was like, mm. you know, I don't, I think you're right. I need to start paying more attention. So I started really focusing on what I wanted to do. Mm. So um, I told my parents that I never actually graduated college, college. I told my parents that I was actually going to go into film school, art school. Mm -hmm. and that's where my film career began. I see. Um, they weren't happy about it mm. at all because my dad, he's a practical person and he wanted me to finish what I started because, mm -hmm. of course, I took out student loans and mm -hmm. but I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. But I knew for sure that I knew film and I could do production without a shadow of a doubt. Something inside of me was just very fiery about that. I had a passion for it. So I remember the night we argued and my mom was trying to convince him that I could do it. And I was trying to convince him I could do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were arguing and I just left the house and walked the neighborhood for that night. It was a nighttime and I just left the house. I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, I, I, why can't they see that this is, the, <laughs> this is what I want to do with my mm -hmm. life? Finally, I know what I want to do. And um, I remember walking around the neighborhood and my dad, he pulled up behind me. I see these headlights coming up behind me. And he pulls up and he opens the door. And he's like, you know, you get in. So we talked like men that night. And we decided that it's probably since I, I had a plan now, I could make it happen. Mm -hmm. That's what's what I was going to do. I was mm -hmm. going to go to art school and follow that path as far as it could take me all the way to the end. So that's what I did. And um, yeah, I, I, I used all the films that I had made mm -hmm. from a hobby, mm -hmm. put those into a packet and mm -hmm. sent it into the school and they accepted me. So Jeez. got me right into school and I started like the next, I think it was a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And course graduated top of my class best mm -hmm. in show did really well there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so at that time we, were you able to to find ways to to have your faith expressed in those movies in many ways uh, yes um not, not necessarily the doctrines uh, mm -hmm. but your faith in a god who loves you or your your belief in uh, there is hope for humanity or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, yes. A lot of my films had this. There's a very popular, um, or he was at the time, director. He had this, you know, he did the same thing. I kind of followed in his mm -hmm. path. And at this time, I was very, I became very secular because of the environment I was in I and because I was kind of aimless still. Mm -hmm. But I was in art school, so I felt like I had purpose. I kind of took on the environment as my own. So the director that I was interested in, he did the same thing. And I was like, okay, I remember this from my childhood. If he can do it, I can do it in my way too. Mm -hmm. So I remember injecting a lot of, you know, uh, of my beliefs into my films. And mm -hmm. it would kind of be like a science meets God kind of thing mm -hmm. where I'd be like, it could be science, it could be a miracle kind of mm -hmm, storyline. Mm -hmm. A lot of my stories were the same, mm -hmm, like very mm -hmm. much similar to that. Because I was in, that's the place I was in life. Sure. Um, it could be, it could be just chance. It could be God. I was mm -hmm. in this, like, not agnostic, but mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, actually more agnostic, not atheist, but agnostic yeah, yeah. point of view. Uh, by then, did you also have a team, a group working with, uh, with you or you were uh, doing everything? <laughs> Pretty much solo. solo. I yeah. had a couple of people I could call on because the school I went to is very hands on. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I excelled so well is because I took it so seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of the only people that would do that. I remember doing a lot of the work most of the time, but there were these a uh, few people, maybe three or four people that I could count on. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And when we put the films together, mm -hmm. we always, always came through in the end. And so I would rely on maybe three or four people mm -hmm. regularly. But other than that, I would do everything myself. I would study overnight. And for how long have you been doing that? Um, working by myself or? Yeah, no, the whole pro uh, movie, I mean, few production. The production thing? Mm -hmm. I would say, um, well, I started it in 2006 mm -hmm. and um, I officially jumped out to do what I'm doing now in 2018, 19, 19. Oh, so, so quite a number of years. Oh yeah, it mm -hmm. was a short, it was a start, but it, it lasted, it still lasts, I still do it, but. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the meantime, I think you became quite skilled and... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I, my skills got sharper and mm -hmm. I was able to mentor other people too. Yeah. Uh, some of them have been screened in different places? Yeah, so different yeah. film festivals. I remember trying yeah. to enter them into film festivals mm -hmm. and um, TV spots. Because mm -hmm. uh, some of them were short films and then of course there were promotions and... Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of different, you know, things like sizzle reels or whatever. But uh, remember, one of the little things I worked on and edited won a little Emmy, Emmy, a local Emmy. Mm -hmm. So that was when I was working for TV. But yeah, every little thing built the next big thing. And I worked to work in Hollywood, got to work in TV. It was really cool at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you still doing it? Video production? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't do it as much mm -hmm. because I'm focused on my health coaching now. Speak on that now. My health coaching? Yes. Yeah. So what would you like to know? <laughs> Where it started? How, how, how it all started about? Okay, so um, while, I, while I was in art school, I was doing the more independent thing. And then I went from independent on into corporate. I decided I wanted to, you know, work with more structure. So I went into corporate America, producing, training videos, promotions, marketing videos, that kind of thing. So it was kind of like this... Um, I was incubated, I guess you could say, in this corporate environment for about seven years mm -hmm. and started following, of course, the corporate cycle as well. You know, you just acquire, 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 climb the ladder. I didn't want that for my life. I wanted to, you know, be more purposeful. In this part of my life, I wanted nothing to do with anything except for things that meant something. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, right around year five is when I decided that I wanted, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in health somehow. Hmm. So um, what happened was actually in one of these years, I actually broke my shoulder. Mm -hmm. This is what got it started. How uh, important was your shoulder? Very important. The, why? <laughs> I mean, every, pe every part of the, the body is important, Everybody's but a, yeah. uh, it, it, it had some specific yes. uh, significance for you. Yes. Um, as a video producer, <laughs> I haul equipment everywhere, you know, <laughs> at, you hold a camera, you need your focus arm, your follow focus arm, you need <laughs> your hands and your all your abilities to produce, sure. not just your mind. And I felt like that was the end for me. <laughs> that, that was the mark of the, that, that was it, hang it up. That, that was your 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, my personal 9-11. <laughs> I was grounded, I was like, no, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> that was my 9-11. <laughs> but yeah, it was like a tap on the shoulder from God because I was just going full steam mm -hmm. ahead mm -hmm. and building up what I call my tiny kingdom. You know, even from the point where I went to art school mm -hmm. on into my adulthood when I was like in corporate, I was like making it, making six figures a year, shooting photography, mm. shooting video. Really? You, you became quite successful? Very successful, yes. Mm. And not just successful, but comfortable. That's what comes with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that feeling at all of being mm -hmm. comfortable because mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it is. It's inspiring me to be, to just keep achieving. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, you know, it was just, here's a paycheck, here's a job, here's mm -hmm. a paycheck. And I was like, I don't want this. I want it to mean something mm -hmm. and money will come obviously, mm -hmm. but I didn't want it to feel comfortable or, mm -hmm. you know, complacent, complacent. Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mediocre. Mm -hmm. That's what it started to feel like in some points. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, mm -hmm. what was the br I mean, that was the beginning of, of this transition to health. Uh, yes. So mm -hmm. breaking my shoulder was the wake up call. It slowed mm -hmm. me down mm -hmm. and I wanted to know how I can get back on my feet, you know. And at that time, I was still searching for God at that time. And I remember being slowed down so much to the point where, you know, where the Bible tells you to be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I had no choice. Mm 
<laughs> I had to <laughs> make God personal in that time because I had no choice. I had to slow down. I felt like I was going to lose my job. I felt like I was going to lose my talent. I felt like I was going to lose my mind because mm. I had to take those painkillers that mm. you can get addicted to. Mm. And I felt like I didn't want that. I was like, I came so far. Lord, what do you want from me? What is your will for my life? Mm. Is this how it ends? Is this, is this the end of Justin? Like, where <laughs> do I go from here? So I started studying health and along with the Bible. It's funny how that works, but figuring how to make myself a better person, a healthier person, goes hand in hand with mm -hmm. your spiritual life. The mm -hmm. more you pull one up, the other one comes mm -hmm. up too. Mm -hmm. If you want to be healthier, you have to realize there's a spirit attached to that. And if you want to be more spiritual, you've got to realize your body's attached to that. Mm -hmm. As I always say, the body is the soil for the spirit. Mm -hmm. You can't just treat it any kind of way and think you're going to be all right. Sure. You know, it always has a weight on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I found out how to heal my shoulder, taking in calcium, absorbing calcium, taking the right vitamins. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember writing down everything I could. Mm -hmm. I wrote it and I lived it. And um, at one point I remember listening to gospel music and sitting and studying the Bible. And I remember like rededicating my life to God and saying, I want to go on your path again. I, mm -hmm. No matter what, I remember getting that feeling back that I got in the atrium when I was staring through the, the, the skylight there. I remember that same feeling came back to me mm. where I felt loved by God again. Mm. And I never would have felt that if I hadn't taken this time to stop, if he hadn't tapped me on my shoulder, literally, mm. to slow mm. me down, to be still enough to look up and call on him that way. Mm. So I followed that path. Uh, a friend of mine at work said, after practicing what I preach, basically, and walking stairs and drinking green shakes and mm -hmm. taking really good care of my body, mm -hmm. I became known as the healthy guy from work, the healthy guy that walks the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and she asked me, what do you do? Can you write down th maybe the top 10 things you do mm -hmm. to stay healthy? And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'll do that for you. I remember it was over Christmas. So I wrote down one thing, two things, all the way to 10. And then I was like, I have your 10 things, but I have so many more ideas. And mm -hmm. she's like, okay, that's fine. It doesn't have to be now. So I just kept writing. Mm -hmm. And out of that came a book. Mm -hmm. Um, the Change Your Mode is the name of the book, and mm -hmm. that was six months later, the book came out, and uh, I gave her, the one that asked me for all these um, tips, gave her the copies along the way, so she asked questions, and I incorporate those questions mm -hmm. into the book <laughs> until it became a more complete thing, and mm -hmm. I was like, here is my book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> read this, and you can, you know, achieve what you want with your health and also mm -hmm. with your spirit, mm -hmm. and I injected all that into the book, and um, I put it on Amazon, and wanted to know more about it, how, to, how I could actually share more. And mm -hmm. then I got accreditation. I got uh, certified as a, a health coach. And oh, you know? I'm a certified health coach, yeah. I see. So I use the book to help people further, but then the one-on-one -on -one and my understanding of it, teaching myself every single day about um, health and healing, um, that's what I do on a normal basis. And I speak on it too. Mm -hmm. So I get invited to do those things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's... Uh Mostly one to one uh, in a personal relationship, or you also go uh, to you know, corporate and uh, I mean present uh, uh, your ideas to a larger group uh, or, or both? Both. Both. Um, it started out one on one mm -hmm. because that's what I'm uh, good at. So the whole good with people thing it does work better for me one on one, where we develop a friendship. And they see that I'm not interested in just, you know, getting up money from them or anything. It's mm -hmm. I really am invested in their help and seeing them become the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So one-on-one -on -one works. But because of that, I've been invited to speak at, you know, church functions or conferences and mm -hmm. things. And that's because of the people that I've coached who say, hey, this guy's a really good coach. Mm -hmm. He should be telling more people about this. Mm -hmm. And so I go up in front of people, tell them about what I know. And then out of those, I get more coaching. So I... It's like this breathing thing. It's the more I do it, the more it grows. And it's been really amazing to watch that happen. Nothing to do with me. All to do with God. I give God all the credit for that because um, I never saw myself doing any of this <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. But thank so, God it turned out. No more of a meteorologist, no more of a videographer. No. <laughs> totally, I, totally different. I shut it off at a faucet. I just went completely 180. Yeah. yeah. But, but Probably in time you could use your videography to to to, to support 
you're, yeah. you're interested in promoting health and yeah so I do you yeah. do that already I do and you also I think you also have a place where you you practice you exemplify some of, of your of your practices yeah uh, tell us more about that so this is a uh, more you know up to date stuff things are happening every day that I'm not even sure what's going to happen next I say <laughs> that a lot I wake up and I pray and I say Lord what will you have me do today and he's like I get a phone call from somebody or I, w I wind up in a place where someone speaks to me. But um, with the working with it, hands-on, of course it was all theory at first, you mm -hmm. know, working with people and everything and working online to get coachings and virtually working with people that I get to work all over the country with. But a brick and mortar was something I've always wanted. So he put in my path this um, cafe mm -hmm. where I got a chance to help her out she needed some help with marketing so i helped her with marketing and she needed help with um running the store so i helped her run the store and then she needed help with managing and, and i was like you know what actually i have some recipes mm -hmm. and i think that would turn things around for you here if you it was a bakery and a coffee shop mm -hmm. and i said why don't you start using more healthy items and seeing if people are interested in that because that's the new trend these days and sure enough, I baked some of my cookies that I sell out of my house and I brought them into her cafe. Mm -hmm. And the very first batch, fresh off the shelves, someone came in and says, mm, I love these. How much can I get for $20? <laughs> now wipe me out. <laughs> so every time I make them, they don't last on this shelf. I mean, I've been making them for about a month now and they just keep getting snatched up. These mm -hmm. really healthy cookies. So, um, yeah, I've got a chance to like show her that there's a better way mm -hmm. and I get a chance to see how it works in mm -hmm. real world, you know, and that I don't know if that's the be all end all, but I know that that's what God wanted to show me for this time. So I'm learning a lot in that process and um, I do deliveries and, you know, I still work online a lot with people marketing their stuff and with videos, the marketing, the social media part of it, I produce videos all the time still. So the skills that I acquired. Um, in art school is the creative side and then of course the marketing side was what I learned in corporate America yeah. So blending those together mm -hmm. especially with what I believe um, Heavily now is in the spiritual side is giving the spiritual message to the marketing piece with the creative spin So it's this perfect marriage of video production that um, I love doing now So it doesn't feel like I'm working. Obviously, it's yeah, obviously exactly. you love that. Oh, yeah. Well, let's agree that uh, You know sometime one year two years down the road We'll meet again and mm -hmm. see what God did in the meantime. Exactly. Thank you very much for sharing the, the, the life story and that is very, very, how to say, perplexing way God wor worked with you. <laughs> Tell me about Having it. so much patience yes. and touching you at the right time, yeah. in the right way. We can't resist such love. Not at all. No, overwhelming. Yes. is what I get every time I think of how he found me yes. you know he's always been searching for me but um, I always have the story that comes to mind is the 99 sheep and the one lost sheep <laughs> and I find myself every morning at, at his side that he's found me in the wilderness you know he's pulled me back hmm. into church and another thing I was going to mention is not only do I use the, the uh, multimedia producing for my business yes. but um, as I started joining the church I saw that the church needed a need for yes. Yes. producing video as well so me and a good team developed this really tight um, AV team. So now that's been growing for the past year mm -hmm. and I'm in charge of video production again. So yes, yes, <laughs> I don't yes. think I ever outrun my gift. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a part of me. I know it. And so I, I'm very good at it and I teach what I can. And the helping is just another talent that God has revealed to me. So like you said, in two years, who knows what that can develop yeah. into. Thank you. Yes, sir. God continue bless, guide and empower you. Thank you. Thank you.